My sincere personal greetings to each of you today. We've been having these virtual meetings together for just about two months since the middle of March. From what we're hearing, we may be able to start meeting again, literally, not virtually, before very long. Thanks for your flexibility, willingness to adapt to this different method of meeting as we sought to steer clear of the contagious and dangerous coronavirus during these weeks of separation. Though invisible, it was aggressive as it found its way around the world, like an out-of-control giant roaming everywhere, leaving suffering and death in its wake. Maybe you never thought of this virus as a giant, but that's what it's been like to many, causing fear and panic to anyone who is especially vulnerable, like those with compromised immune systems and others in ill health and getting up in years. That analogy about giants got me to thinking about many of the giants we face in life. To begin with, they're all really big. Huge is a better description. They tower over us, and we tend to shuffle in their shadow. Overimpressed by size, we usually feel small, insignificant, overwhelmed, outmatched, and intimidated when we're in the presence of a giant. By the way, that happened to me years ago when Cynthia and I vacationed with several in our family on Kauai, one of the smaller and more remote islands in the chain of the beautiful Hawaiian islands. As I got up one morning early, planning to do an early morning jog along the beach, I opened the door of our hotel and stepped out into the hallway. To my absolute surprise, standing a few feet from me was a seven-foot, two-inch giant. I had just watched this man win the NBA championship with his team of Los Angeles Lakers only a couple of weeks earlier. But there he stood, staring down at me. He had lost the key to his room and was roaming around the hallway to see if he or his wife had dropped it there. Like most of you, I'd seen Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on television screens as he and other giants were running up and down the court. But I'd never actually been that close, uh, like wilting a few inches in his presence while under his gauge. Oh, uh, hi, I'm, I'm Bobby. No, no, I'm Tom. Oh, no, actually, I, I, I'm Chuck. Believe it or not, uh, his, his key was on the floor in our room. I'd just seen it. His wife thought our room was their room, so she had slid it under our door. I could have said, since he had just won the championship, I've got your key. How about a tip? No, no, you don't even mess around with a giant. They seem bigger than life. Your head swims. Your brain sort of shuts down. Like that lady in Beverly Hills while she was waiting in line for an ice cream cone at 31 Flavors. Who should walk up behind her? None other than Paul Newman, the famous film star. She glances back at him. He smiles, and she quickly looks away, blushing. I'm not going to lose my cool. He's just another guy. I'm not going to say something stupid, she says to herself. She gets to the counter and orders her ice cream cone, pays for it, and then walks out. As she sits down in a car, she recovers with a deep sigh. She made it. But she doesn't have her ice cream cone. Uneasily, she slips back in, and Paul Newman is by that time at the counter, waiting for his order. He sees her looking around, so he says, uh, Did you lose something? Uh, yeah, my ice cream cone. Newman said to her, uh, You put it in your purse. <laughs> it would be great if we could just laugh off life's giants. But we can't. This is especially true when they come up close and they threaten us. Today, we're returning to one of the greatest stories in all the Bible. 
This giant's name is Goliath. We could call David the ultimate underdog. Today you'll hear some things that will help you see Goliath wasn't nearly as powerful or impressive as you have always thought he was. And the same is true of the giants in your life that have intimidated you and caused you to feel afraid long enough. Never forget this. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. As we worship today, may the significance of our God reduce the size of all your giants. Let's worship our great God. In your hymnal, you will locate number eight, which will be our starting point. The other hymns of the morning will be mentioned for you. Please note, when you sing hymns, remember you're singing a song that revolves around a theological theme. The great thing about hymnody, they almost without question teach us about our God. This first one is called, Come Thou Almighty King. And when you sing it, you may have never known before, though you've sung it through your Christian life, you're singing about the Trinity. You sing first about the Father, second stanza about the Son, third stanza about the Spirit, and then the fourth, to the great one in three. We'll sing of the Trinity. So hymn number eight, now that you're seated and settled, stand up, please, for the song that we'll sing together.
There are three important words theologically that are helpful to remember. One is revelation, and the other is inspiration, and the third is application. Revelation took place when God uh, marvelously and miraculously revealed revelation, revealed his truth to those who would receive it. Uh, this took place as the Bible was being written by a number of different individuals over a period of about 1,500 years. Inspiration is what happens when the scriptures are received and recorded without error in their original manuscripts. So individuals who received God's word were inspired, not like a poet is inspired to write a song, but like God breathed truth into them. Theopneustos from theos, meaning God, and neustos starts with a P, but you don't pronounce it. It means breath, God's breath. He reveals himself to individuals. Now, get this. Revelation has ceased. God is no longer giving his inerrant word. Inspiration has ceased. He is no longer choosing individuals to receive truth and to write the autographa, the original writings from his breath to our hearts. However, the application of his word takes place regularly. We might call it illumination, where the Spirit of God takes his word and enlightens us, illumines the truth that has been revealed and recorded for our understanding. And that inspiration, by the way, crosses the line of Old and New Testament. There are many people who sort of shrug their shoulders when you speak of the Old Testament as if uh, that, would, that was then. It, that's sort of uh, ancient, out of date. It's all ancient. None of it is out of date. But the same God who is ever present with us, as we just heard sung, was engaged in the writing of the truths of the Old Testament books as well as the New Testament. So we're drawing these uh, marvelous uh, epical events, we're calling them, which uh, nobody expected. All four, interestingly, are from the Old Testament. Abraham with Isaac, Joseph with his brothers, David dealing with the giant, and then next time, a, a, a sad prophet and a bad queen, Elijah and Jezebel, the queen. We're looking at 1 Samuel 17 in God's inspired word. And because the chapter is lengthy, 58 verses, you'll be glad to know I don't plan to read all of the chapter in the scripture reading, but just excerpts here and there. The story is familiar to us, but get this, as is true of all things familiar, we've missed much of it because of familiarity. When something is so familiar, we're no longer thinking fresh thoughts about it. We don't enter into it with new understanding. So that's my job and yours as a teacher, if you happen to be someone who communicates the truth, to go into the familiar and help point out what is easily missed, at the same time remaining true and accurate with the inspired text of God's word. I want to read several verses from 1 Samuel 17 out of the New Living Translation. You follow along as we move from one verse to another here. And let's stand together with our eyes on 1 Samuel chapter 17. 
verse 4, Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and a bronze coat of mail that weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Verse 22. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, the Philistine champion from Gath came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Verse 32. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. Verse 40. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream put them into his shepherd's bag, then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. 42. Am I a dog? Goliath roared at David, that you come to me with sticks. And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. Verse 47, everyone assembled there will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle he will give you to us. Verse 50, so David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. I like that verse for some reason. I just, I just like the way it sounds. Before I pray, every one of us has giants in our lives. They're not nine feet tall. They don't wear armor. They don't roam the valley of Elah. They don't have a name like Goliath, but they're giants nevertheless. And unless I miss my guess, you're afraid of yours. And I'm sometimes afraid of mine. Let's pray about that. Lord, speak to us today in ways that we can understand so that we stay realistic 
rather than running scared, letting our imaginations run wild, and finding a place to hide in this life, remembering that greater is he who is in us than whoever may be in this world. Thank you, Father, for putting us up against those things that we cannot overcome, which forces us to remember that it's the Lord's battle. It's your battle. We're, we're, we're not able to do that fighting against our giants. They're overwhelming. And because that's true, we leave them with you. And may we learn how to do that from this scene that has been preserved for our understanding and application. Thank you for the joy of giving that giants may be conquered beyond us in the community around us, in the shores on the other side of the world and in lands where we'll never go, among people who speak languages we don't know. Use these gifts for that purpose, and also, Lord, rid us from the giant of debt as we give our gifts today. Use them toward that end. We pray in faith, unintimidated, through Christ our Lord. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
there's something in all of us that pulls for the underdog. We just love it when an individual who isn't supposed to win wins big. When the little guy beats the big guy. When the unknown and uh, ill-equipped team beats the team that is well-equipped and established that everybody says will win. We love it when we go back to the 18th century and, and we remember that, that, that band of brothers called Minutemen who went up against the better equipped and well-fed soldiers of the Redcoats and whipped them and we won our, our freedom from England. We love that. We still brag about the, the, the miracle on ice as we go back to that hockey game up at Lake Placid when that unknown group of hockey players whipped the Soviets at their game. <laughs> and, and, and the goalie wrapped himself in the American flag. Remember that? Skated out on the ice rink. We were far removed from ice, but I remember going, yes, yes. Why? Because, because I'm pulling for the underdog. And who can ever forget that ragtag bunch of football players called the New York Jets who had the audacity with a rookie quarterback named Joe Namath to take on the Baltimore Colts, coached by uh, a legend, and, 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 and they beat them 16 to 7, still remembered as one of the top games of the, of, of the Super Bowl history, because the underdog won. What's interesting to me is all of that is true as long as we are not the underdog. <laughs> Something happens, there's sort of a reversal of roles or mentality when we are the ones who are outnumbered or outweighed or outmaneuvered. And left alone, we begin to feel reluctant and fearful and intimidated and even entertaining thoughts of defeat before we've even entered into the fight. Strange how that works. Because it's true, I believe God preserved the story in the scriptures that is one of the greatest examples of an epical event nobody expected. No one would have picked David over Goliath. Nobody. It just didn't wash. What's interesting is that I've heard this presented and I've also preached it many times, but I think I've missed some things and I think I have missed those things when I've heard others present the story of, Deli of, of David and Goliath. In fact, uh, one of the things we need to remember as we get into it are, are the words of 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. I want you to look at that right now because it will sort of weave its way through the fabric of chapter 17. These are the words that uh, the Lord gives to a man named Samuel who is looking for the next king. And he's in the, he's in the little home in Bethlehem owned by Jesse. And Jesse's parading his sons in front of Samuel. And Samuel's all impressed with, with, with Eliab, who apparently is the tallest among the brothers. There are eight of them. And the Lord says to him, don't, don't, don't be impressed by his height. That's in verse 6. And then the Lord says, The Lord does not judge by his appearance, or don't judge by his appearance or by his height, for I have rejected him. Eliab's not my man. 
The Lord doesn't see things. Look, look at this. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. If you will possibly be able to force yourself to remember anything from this, remember that. Because that's a principle that holds true throughout life and through time. We are all impressed with, often intimidated by, overwhelmed because of others who outrank us or outmaneuver us or outthink us or simply able to win a battle better than we are and we forget that God does not judge individuals by outward appearance, but by the truth of their lives, the condition of their hearts. That's why he chose David, whom, whom Jesse, David's father, had, had overlooked. Samuel had to say to David, are, are these all your sons? He goes, you know, I, I, got, I, got, I got one more. He's, he's out in the field. David, he whistles and he brings David in. And the, and the Lord says to Samuel, behold, the Lord's anointed is before you. And I'm sure the older brothers, because they judge by outward appearance, immediately were envious. And before David knew it, didn't even know what it was about, the oil is running down the back of his neck as he's anointed the king-elect. Because the Lord looks at the heart. He knew David had what it took. Now we come to the giant. A little bit of time has passed since the anointing. David is back with the sheep watching over his father's sheep and goats. The Valley of Elah is now a place of conflict, and when you go to Israel, you can visit the valley. It's still there. A vast mile across it as it slopes slowly down to a ravine at the base and comes back up the other side. And here we find a study in contrast Here we find Saul, who is the commander of the Israelite army, scared to death over Goliath. As we read earlier, his height is nine, literally about nine feet, nine inches tall, just three inches shorter than a basketball rim at 10 feet. That's big. And he wears armor that weighs 125 pounds the coat of mail from his shoulders to his knees, just the coat of mail he wore, 125 pounds. The, the spear head, solid iron, 15 pounds, and a javelin slung between his shoulders, and a shield bearer. I mean, this is one intimidating presence, humanly speaking. In fact, you will see the contrast in the verses. Look at, uh, look at verse 24. Let's, let's, let's go there. 1 Samuel 17, 24. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, that's Goliath, they began to run away in fright. Now, now why would they do that? They judged by outward appearance. And so they say to, to David, who has come to visit the brothers at the battle site, hey, have you seen the giant? He comes out each day to defy Israel. By the way, you know who the tallest one was in the Israelite army? Saul the king. Stood head and shoulders above everyone else. 
but he's leading them on the retreat. He's in the tent, knees knocking with his troops, scared of Goliath, who is only one man out on the other side of the Valley of Elah. But look at the other response, verse 32. David says, don't, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. Uh, I, I, I'll go fight him. This isn't a teenage braggadocio. This isn't uh, arrogance. And by the way, this is no miracle story. Don't, don't make this into a miracle. It's all very reasonable when we take it apart, as I plan to do. It makes sense that David wouldn't be intimidated. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll go fight this uncircumcised Philistine who has the audacity to defy the armies of the living God. That's my country. Israel is my country. How dare he do that? Now, Saul's response, verse 33, don't be ridiculous. Why did he say that? Because he's looking at the outward appearance. So he says to David, there, there's, there's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. Once again, judging from outward appearance, David is about mid to later teenage years. And he said, he's been a man of war since his youth. He's mean as a junkyard dog. You're, you're, you're dealing with a, with a beast. So settle down. Settle down. We'll work this out, David. Well, David doesn't believe in settling down. Look at verse 34. Verse 34. David persisted. Now, here's why. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb. Wait, 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 wait. This is a four-footed, top-of-the-food-chain predator named a bear. Maybe a lion from Syria. I... I I fought against them. And he's out in the open field, nobody else around. I, I, I go after the club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. You got to be pretty close to rescue a lamb from the mouth of the animal. And then the animal turns on me. I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I like verses like that. <laughs> it's, it's the Marine in me. I know, I know. Don't write me. Uh, it, it's just, I like stuff like that. And, 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 and he, he's, he's finished. Why? Be, be, because David is not intimidated. He's learned how to see and how to perceive when the odds are against him. You probably were never taught that growing up. You, you, you were... You were probably uh, around a lot of intimidation. So you picked it up. So when you hit up against a giant, uh, you're already beaten. Don't go there. This is a perfect place for me to hit the pause button and uh, do some in-depth analysis of warfare in ancient days and explain that. And also to remind all of us that even for underdogs, if we have a memory and if our theology is straight, we're well equipped. That's all we need. Because the memory will remind us of the great things God has done and proved himself strong which means he can do that again. 
And the theology will remind us that the, the, the battle is his. David didn't go into that battle thinking of himself as, as bigger than the giant. He's not bigger than the giant. But he was equipped with a strength the giant didn't have. And it was the name of the Lord his God whom he took with him. So, please forever remove the word miracle from the story. Just take that out of your vocabulary. There's nothing miraculous about what David did or what happened in the Valley of Elah. Let me go into a little bit of an analysis and you'll see why I say that. Listen closely. You'll hear things you've not heard before, most likely. Ancient warfare had three kinds of warriors. First, the cavalry, which is always done with horses. Either the warrior is riding the horse or is riding in a chariot pulled by horses. The cavalry. The second is the infantry. This would be the foot soldier. Infantry personnel were heavily armed. They, they often carried shields and they were equipped with, with uh, intimidating weapons that were built for up close fighting. The cavalry, the infantry, and the third you've not learned about. These would be the artillery, but that's our word for them. In those days, they were the projectile warriors. They were in two different categories, the archers and the slingers. Get familiar with the second. That's what David is. The archers needed a shield bearer to travel with them because they needed both hands to use their weapons, a bow and arrows, to pull the arrows from the quiver and to string the arrow and then to aim it and release it took both hands. So for them to be protected, they needed shield bearers. But the, the infantry carried their own because they fought with swords or clubs or knives and they fought up close so their shield was part of their, part of their defense. The slingers were like snipers. They traveled light. They wore no, no armor. They carried no weapons except a little pouch of leather with long leather strand or a rope on each side of the little pouch in which they would place either a hard lead ball more often than not, a rock. They would pinch that little pouch together, wrap one of the strings around their fingers tightly, and they would leave the other one that could be loosened as they would swing it. Ever increasing the speed until finally it reached the place where the rock in the sling was a devastating weapon. They could hit their target up to 200 yards, twice the length of a football field. They were such a deadly group to fight that the Romans even had special tongs that were made for infantrymen to carry and the tongs were designed to remove stones that had been embedded into their fellow soldiers by slingers that threw the rocks at them. 
If you wonder about the uh, power of the rock, I gave thought to an illustration. Stand in a major league baseball stadium at home plate, put a major league baseball player on the mound who aims at your head. That's what facing a slinger in the battle was like. Only what was being slung at you was not made of cork and twine wrapped around, covered with leather, like a baseball, but a solid rock. And were they accurate? I'm going to show you something, maybe a verse you've never seen before. Go back a couple of books to Judges. Please do. Judges chapter 20. It'll be worth your visit. 20 verse 16. This is sort of a listing of various kinds of soldiers, and we get to the soldiers of Benjamin. Look at verse 16. Among Benjamin's elite troops, 700 were left-handed. God bless them. I think it's great because I'm left-handed. So it says, and each hit a target within a hair's breadth without missing. Southpaw slingers. Coke right between the running lights, right where I was aiming. All of a sudden, it's becoming much more reasonable. Now, you haven't heard half of it. The average standard infantry soldier is weighed down with thick armor, Heavy weaponry. They're sitting ducks in the presence of an accurate slinger. By the way, there are, there are pictures, art pictures of the medieval era when slingers are hitting birds in flight. Speaking of accuracy. They were sitting ducks to the slingers who could launch a stone from 100 to 200 yards away with deadly accuracy. David was not intimidated. He had practiced that sling for years. Itan Hirsch is the name of a ballistic expert with the Israeli Defense Forces. He did a series of calculations showing that a typical size stone by an expert slinger at a distance of 35 meters, a little over 100 yards, would have hit Goliath's head in a little more than one second. Another historian writes, Goliath had about as much chance against David as a Bronze Age warrior with a sword would have had against an opponent armed with a 45 automatic pistol. Returning to the original scene in the Valley of Elah, how easy it was to have been intimidated by the giant unless you were a slinger. Giants simply mean the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Which was in David's mind, I'm sure. Goliath is huge, admittedly, 9'9", nine, nine, of course, compared to David. David is small and slender. The giant is heavily armored, carrying massive weapons. David has no armor and carries only a sling and a shepherd's staff. Look at verse 40, where he picks up the five smooth stones, puts them into his bag, then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, started across the valley to fight the Philistine. 
Remember, King Saul is an infantryman. He thinks in terms of size and statistics and human power. David is a shepherd whose life is spent based on faith in the open field dealing with predators like packs of wolves and roaming hungry bears and an occasional lion. Over the years, he has relied on stealth and speed and surprise and a sling. During my research into this uh, ancient scene, I came across several fascinating observations and insights regarding this lumbering giant. It's always interested me some things about Goliath that no one had ever answered before. I call on your memory because of your familiarity with the story as I point out these two or three observations. First, Goliath comes into the valley with a shield bearer, but he's not an archer. Why would an infantryman like Goliath, that size, even need a shield bearer? Why doesn't he carry it for himself, sword in one hand, shield in the other? Why would Goliath need an archer's shield bearer if he could handle a shield on his own? Maybe... The shield bearer played another role. Keep that in the back of your mind because he did. Second, the comments of the, of the giant are strange. Why does Goliath tell David to come to him? Look at it. Verse 43, am I a dog? He roared. That, that, that you come at me with sticks, and, and, and he cursed David with the names of his God. Come over here, he said. Come over here, and I'll, and I'll give your flesh to the birth. Why didn't he go to David? He's the larger of the two. Why would he ask a slinger to come closer? It's like asking a man with a 45 to come closer, which only increases the accuracy unless he didn't know that he had a sling. And why would he curse David and taunt him, knowing that to arouse the anger of a slinger only increases the intensity of his intentions? Unless Goliath couldn't see all that well. Now stay with me. He asked Am, am I a dog that you come to me with st the sticks? The Hebrew says, in plural, the sticks. But according to the previous verse, David only had a shepherd's staff, singular. He didn't have several. Why would Goliath, especially if David's coming closer, refer to the sticks in David's hands? Medical doctors have weighed in on this, and they have come to some conclusions that are fascinating. Many now believe that this giant was a man who had serious medical a serious medical condition. His actions and his words look and sound like a person suffering from what is called acromegaly, acromegaly, A-C-R-O-M-E-G-A-L-Y. Dictionary has the word, you can check it for yourself. Acromegaly, which is the pathological enlargement 
of the bones of the hand, the feet, the face, and the head. That is caused by the chronic enlargement and overactivity of the pituitary gland in the base of the brain inside Goliath's cranium. And get this, one of the common side effects of acromegaly are tumors. And the tumors on the pituitary are known to cause visionary problems because they grow to the point that they compress the optic nerves with the result that those with this problem often suffer severely restricted sight called diplopia, D-I-P-L-O-P-I-A. We know it as double vision. It's what you see when you cross your eyes. The world around you becomes a blur. This helps explain, first, why Goliath was led into the valley with a shield bearer. He couldn't see where he was going. He couldn't make out clearly his opponent, which required David to come closer at Goliath's invitation. Life around him was a blur. Goliath often reminds me of the cross-eyed discus thrower. He didn't set many records, but he kept the crowd awake. I've always loved that story. <laughs> if, if, if David didn't come closer to Goliath, uh, he'd, he'd remain a blur, which explains why Goliath never knew he had a sling. His opponent had a sling. And which explains why he called what was in his hand those sticks. Now listen to me. It is easy to forget that what gave the giant his enormous size was the source of his greatest weaknesses. That's always true. That's always true. That's why we don't go by size. That's why statistics don't intimidate when you have the right perspective. There's an important lesson here for all of us, each of whom battles his or her own giants. The powerful and fearful in appearance are not always what they seem to be. The Lord's earlier words, uh, I, I, I don't see like humans see. You look at appearance and you're very impressed. You see a beautiful woman or a woman not that pretty. I, I, I don't pay attention to that. You see a slender and sleek and, and a man in good shape. I don't pay attention to that. that, that that's not my focus, says the Lord. I look at the heart. That's why I've said for years, it is all about character. Or as Winston Churchill would say it, character. It is about character. And with character, you could face any giant. And David had it. David viewed the giant as the Lord saw him. So he ran toward the giant without fear. Happy with the invitation, it only meant his stone would, mark, would hit the mark exactly on target. Whereas Goliath was unaware of who he was fighting. He had no idea he had in front of him a confident, experienced, unintimidated, and very accurate slinger in David. Now, all of that was then, dated in the ancient days when the Valley of Elah was still blooming and the ravine had its rocks, 
where David chose those five to put in his, in his bag, that he would choose one. Interesting, he chose smooth ones. They would make a more accurate trajectory. He knew exactly what he was doing. We, we are not uh, slingers. We are believers in Jesus Christ. We have been equipped with the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is a member of the Trinity with all the powers pertaining thereto. We are equipped with the one who has never known intimidation. He lives within us. He exists as a resident within our being for the purpose of getting us on our feet, off our backs, out of our tents of fear, and into the faces of our giants. As I said earlier, we all face them. Let me help you with a few of them. There are domestic giants. One of them is called a divorce. Some of you have gone through or are going through a divorce. It's a giant to you. It's not to anyone else, but it is to you. Because you've told yourself that it has statistics and it has a downside to it that makes you less than others. It's a giant. Yes, there was failure on both sides, of course. But it's a giant. Maybe your giant is a wandering son or, or, or daughter. Uh, it, it could be death. And your spouse in life has been taken from you. And you grieve. And you find yourself wanting to draw your drapes and lock your door and live an isolated life. The worst possible response. That's what you do when you're a Saul. You run from the giant. But it's a giant. Your giant may be a sick loved one hanging between life and death, and it requires exhausting labor to care for that person. That's a giant. It's not impossible. Maybe yours is a personal giant. You have a serious health issue, and things don't look like they're getting better. Or maybe you're facing a lawsuit. Anything more intimidating than being served papers? Or you're being forced to move from the familiar and the secure to the unfamiliar. We know a couple right now, dear, dear couple in Christ, who are facing that very, that very thing. And you probably know some as well. And to them, it is a huge issue. They love where they live, but they sense God may not be in their staying there. So they, it, all the unknowns are in front of them. It's like a giant. Or maybe you've gotten yourself into a mess and the complications are building. Could be you're given to depression or loneliness, all giants, and nothing but giants. And let me mention the A word, you're aging. It's starting to bother you. I've always liked Jim Dobson's description, how fast aging comes. About the time your face clears up, your mind gets fuzzy. <laughs> it happens quick. We don't expect it. We start to, you know, get aches in the joints and we start having problems and we begin to share our operations with others and, and the story goes on and on. Stop it! Stop it! Why would you yield to a giant? Everybody ages. Some more obviously, more, more drastically than others, but it's a giant. Face it! It's no accident. God knows exactly what he's doing in your life. You're, you're no surprise to him any more than Goliath lumbering along the other side of the Valley of Elah was a surprise. So you're aging. Welcome to the club. We're all there. I like to visit with people before our services start, and they always say, I'm so glad to be here. I respond with, I'm so glad to be anywhere, actually. <laughs> Doesn't matter where I am. Why? Because it's a giant. I'm not going to live intimidated by the giant. Everybody told me when I was in my mid-60s to retire. 
hang up the cleats, take it easy. Why would I do that? You and I would have never met. This building would have never been here. We would have never known what God's plan was in the future had I given in to a few people who wanted me to hide in the tent because of the giant of aging. Who wrote the book that says you hang it up when you're 64 or 59 or 81 or 92? When we had our group going to Israel, we had a bus, bus seven. It's a great group. It was the Jade bus. They renamed it the Joy bus because one of their people on the bus was named Joy, 94 years old, who spent her time on the bus saying, everybody get out, we're going up that hill. 94 years old, the Joy bus. What are you doing when you're 94? You're making excuses. You're living intimidated by the giant. Aren't you glad David wasn't? That's a personal giant. Uh, I, I, I can't pass up economic giants. We've all faced them, spending more than we had, making bad mistakes with our money, not setting aside as much as we should, starting our own business, it goes under. Are you aware that more businesses go under than make it? Yeah, it's, 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 it's too bad. We're sorry for that. But you can be under the giant of discouragement and blame yourself from here on because your business failed. Talk to people who have succeeded, and they'll tell you about several things they did before the success where they were miserable failures. It's a giant. How about a spiritual giant? Unbelief. Unbelief says until I get every single question answered, I'm not going to commit myself to that person that hung on a cross, claimed he was dying for my sins. Oh, really? How are you going to do in hell when you die? What are you going to use then as an excuse? You want to know something? You're sitting around believers today, all of whom left their unquestioned, their unanswered questions at the cross. I have a number of them. I just don't focus on them. I'd rather live in light of faith and let God handle the things I can't answer than run the risk that I may be risking eternity for the sake of my pride. Don't let that happen. Now, back to David, and I'm through. How do you do it? Get this. Number one, he remembered how God had strengthened him in days past. He had a lot of wolves and lion and bear stories. Don't forget those stories. Every one of us can name them. When you have an anniversary, go back and remember whatever the anniversary. Remember when. And call to mind those things God did. It'll strengthen your faith for today. He remembered the God of yesterday, which gave him strength for the God of today. Let me tell you the second one. His theology was straight. It helped him with his perspective. When he went on to face the giant, he said while going across the valley, the battle is the Lord's battle. And I'm, I'm not doing this on my own. He's with me. Saul and all the guys in the tent back across the valley are staring in disbelief. David is having the time of his life, taking on Goliath in the strength of the Almighty. When your theology is, is great, your perspective is clear. When it gets fuzzy, you start doubting, running scared, and holding back. That's what this story is about. And frankly, there will be times you'll need to be very creative because I will assure you, giants are ahead of you that you can't even guess will come in the days ahead. They're, they're coming. And we don't, we don't know what they are. It's, it's like the story I've loved for years. There was this very uh, a faithful man of integrity and enterprising who opened a little general store in a community. He sold some groceries and he sold some hardware and 
He sold some fabrics, and it was just a general store that people were able to come and buy what they needed in the community. Well, as time passed, you would expect there was urban renewal, and the, the, the town grew to a city, and before long, there were the, the, uh, the big guys that showed up and said to him, we'd like to buy your property because we're going to move in some gigantic stores that'll just consume you. And he said, no, uh, you're not buying my store. This is my store. It's my property. I'm not selling. They said, well, we're going to build a huge, huge grocery store right here. And they did. Bulldozers came in, cleared the land, built this massive grocery store, sold a lot of the same foods he sold to his clientele for years. And now they're selling them even, even for less. And wouldn't you know it, the bulldozers came there on the other side and built great store of, of uh, uh, all kinds of uh, things that people need. You know, like a big Walmart. They have carried everything. All the hardware he carried and all the fabrics he carried and, and they're there in multiple choices. And this. So here are these two towering giants on each side of him. Here he is in his little, little store. So what's he going to do? Now he could have licked his wounds and felt sorry for himself the rest of his life, but he didn't. He pooled his resources and went to the best sign shop in the city and had them make him a large sign that would be neon lighted, full of color, had only three words, but it would go above his door, right there in the middle on that little store. Main entrance here. <laughs> and you know what? People believe that. What are you going to do with the giants around you? Is your story when you're laid to rest, he, he just gave up? He was intimidated? It was too much for him? He didn't realize that God was at work to, to uh, reshape his life, to reframe his whole way of thinking, to renew his future. Let me speak on my own here. I can tell you in my personal testimony, you, you cannot be walking by faith. You cannot be stepping into the battle in the strength of the Lord. You cannot be ignoring the majority who will give you bad advice based on the culture, the media. The whole thing is going to hell in a handbasket. You're going to be swept along with it. Oh, really? You know, I'm not buying a ticket there. I'm not going there. God's plan for me is different. And that's where I'm going. And that's where I want to lead you as we go together across the valley of Elah and watch God kill the giants and lead us into victory. Bow with me, will you? Thank you, Father, for the joy of realizing that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. That there is really no miracle here. This is simply a a young man who had learned how faithful you are and how accurate you can make him and how courageous you can turn him into a man of, of incredible skill through your power. Help us all to lay aside the scales of unbelief and, 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 and the fears that we have clung to long enough and realized the main entrance to our lives is right here, right where we find ourselves, not an escaping to some place like some mythic utopia. Bring us home, our Father, to yourself. Strengthen our theology. Stabilize our faith as we walk by faith and not by sight. In the name of Jesus, I pray, everyone said, amen. 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 <laughs> Isn't it remarkable how relevant God's word remains? 
Like young David, we all face our own giants that seem more intimidating than they really are. Yeah, they, they loom large and they want you to think that you don't stand a chance against them. Our giants don't have names like Goliath. They have other names like fear and depression, loneliness and lust, pain and grief, financial drain and physical disabilities, and dozens of others. All overpowering beasts that siphon our joy and steal our peace. Giants want you to think you're defeated, you're done. But neither is true. Wasn't true for David, and it certainly isn't true for you and me. Let's go back to that ancient story. Remember, David stopped as he made his way up to face the giant. In 1 Samuel 17, 40, we read these simple words that we easily overlook. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream. Sitting on my desk here in my study is a bag of five smooth stones. I literally took them from that stream that still flows in the Valley of Elah. They provide me with five reminders that still defeat giants. Let's go through them together. Stone number one, I can't fight my giants in someone else's armor. Saul tried to get David to wear his armor. David looked foolish, even clownish in Saul's armor. So he said, I, I can't go in these. I'm not used to them. The lesson from that, you must learn to operate using what works for you, not what works for your pastor or your, your uh, best friend. You must be authentic. Wear your own armor. It's got to be God and you alone. Stone number two. I'm not able to conquer any giant all on my own. David told Goliath, today the Lord will conquer you. You hear that? I learned years ago this simple statement, I try, I fail. I trust, he succeeds. Jesus said it best, without me, you can do nothing. Stone number three. Fighting giants is the Lord's battle. Now, why? Because he's greater than any giant. He's more powerful than any foe, any habit, any obstacle, any addiction, any threat. Those are the things he specializes in. With him, nothing is impossible. Here's the fourth. Killing a giant requires only the essentials. Remember the climax of the story? We read David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Only the bare essentials, a sling, a stone. Shepherds didn't carry swords. He slung stones. He didn't swing swords. Don't make it complicated. Keep it simple. What you need is courageous faith, confident hope. Stand still. Watch the deliverance of the Lord. Stone number five. To be ready for the next giant, keep reminders of previous victories. We read that David took Goliath's head to Jerusalem but he stored the giant's armor in his own tent. I, th I think that's significant. All of us need our own private trophy case, which we can name our victory case. Some tangible, visible reminders of previous battles that we went through and the Lord gave victory. They not only remind us of great victories, they, they give us the opportunity to pass along to others some of our own great stories of the giants from our past, all of whom were conquered. 
It, it may be a book you saved from a fire. Could be your uniform from your years in the military. Or a document where the Lord enabled you to live through and even win that lawsuit. Maybe a photo, even an album that's filled with great memories. These photos of the past. Deuteronomy 8.2 reads, You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness. I wrote a book years ago, which I wrote in the memory of a great man, now gone, named Clyde Cook. He was at that time the president of Biola University. I titled it, A Life Well Lived. I dedicated it to him when I brought that particular graduation speech at commencement, his last commencement with the school. When Dr. Cook died, I grieved his passing. But as I hold this book, I'm reminded of a victory in my life that I experienced as I knew him and he remained my close friend. Gather these five stones as reminders that still defeat giants. May I review them for us? I can't fight my own giants in someone else's armor. I'm not able to conquer any giant I face all on my own. Fighting giants is the Lord's battle. He must win the victory. Number four, killing a giant requires only the essentials. And finally, to be ready for your next giant, Keep reminders of previous victories. Your own personal trophy case will keep you ready. Keep those in mind. I'll see you next time. <laughs>